Well, it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to bring to you our work on revealing the origin of mass in the universe. What I'm going to do over the next few minutes is take you for a walk through the kind of research that we're doing in quantum field theory. Supercomputing plays a very important role in our research program, and so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the top 500 supercomputers and understanding the way in which the Australian supercomputers fit into this top 500 index. I'll then take you for a tour of some of our most recent results and perhaps show you things about the world in which you live that you've never seen before, experienced before. So what I'm going to do is ask you to leave your everyday experiences behind at the scale of the order of 10 centimeters. We're going to go past nanoscience and realms of chemistry, past the structure of the atom. We're going to look at the atomic nucleus at the heart of the atom. And even better, we're going to go smaller than that. We're going to look at the individual protons and neutrons, collectively called nucleons, and understand their structure in terms of the most fundamental degrees of freedom, the quarks and gluons of quantum chromodynamics, or QCD for short. QCD is the most fundamental theory that describes how quarks, which are the building blocks of matter, interact with each other through the exchange of gluons. They're very much the glue that binds quarks together in forming visible matter, the matter that we see in our universe. What we're trying to do is understand from the very first principles of the quantum field theory what the emergent phenomena is from QCD. What does QCD actually predict for our universe? And what insights into how our universe works can, can we obtain from that? The reason it's an interesting, complicated problem is because empty space is actually unstable to being empty. That costs a lot of energy. And what it prefers to do is have quark and gluon field fluctuations in empty space. And now you're thinking, wait a minute, I can't see these things. How do I know they're there? Well, you don't because the photons that enter our eyes and allow us to see don't actually directly couple to those gluon fields that are filling empty space. So let's try and understand what that gluon field might look like. You see, photons mediate the interactions between charged particles. That's how one charged particle over here knows that another charged particle is over here. They're exchanging photons between them. And it's that process that gives rise to things like opposite charges attracting each other. Gluons do the same thing, but whereas photons don't carry the electric charge, gluons do. And as a result, gluons can directly interact with other gluons. And they can do that in two different ways. There's a diagram here on the left that shows a gluon uh, coupling to two other gluons. On the right, we have a four gluon interaction. Uh, one comes proportional to G, that's the strong coupling constant. It's like the electric charge in quantum electrodynamics, it's the strong coupling in quantum chromodynamics. And as a result, it's this uh, unusual interaction that gives rise to empty space not being empty. Now how many gluons are there? You can see that they're composed of a color and an anticolor, it's a nice way of thinking about them. And you might be thinking, OK, that's three colors, red, green, and blue, times three anticolors. That's nine gluons. But one of them is a color singlet. Red anti-red plus green anti-green, blue anti-blue. That one doesn't count. And so there are actually eight colored combinations, or eight kinds of gluons. Let's take a look at the proton mass and how that comes about. You need two up quarks. Up is a particular flavor of quark. You need two of those, and they have three MeV mass each, so we're looking at six MeV. You need one down quark that has a mass of about five MeV. Added up, you've got 11 MeV, but there's a problem. The proton's mass is 940 MeV. So you've got to be asking, where's that 99% of the mass? It's missing. And where does it come from? What is the origin of the proton's mass? Well, to answer that question, we have to take this field theory, quantum chromodynamics, and put it onto a space-time lattice. So the idea is that the gluon fields, at each point in space-time, you'll have a gluon field, 
the gluon field is a vector field, so you need to associate a direction with it. So it's actually the links that the gluon field sits on. Because there's eight gluons, each link is actually a three by three complex special unitary matrix that has the eight degrees of freedom that we need. Now, I've only il illustrated a very, very tiny lattice here, five by four by four. Typical lattices these days are 32 cubed by 64. And so we're talking about a lot of sites. Let's think about the computational budget associated with handling that kind of data. You've got that many sites that you need to look after. There's four directions for the vector field. There are eight electric fields, and there are another eight magnetic fields. Multiply it all out, and you're looking at 134 million degrees of freedom. Now, it turns out that what we're trying to do here is actually do an integral over each field. That means we're trying to do a 100 million dimensional integral. And yeah, that's hard. So as a result, we spend a lot of time paying attention to the top 500 performance index. This is an index that started back in the early 90s. And what you're looking at here on the x-axis, the year, and on the y-axis, the RMAX performance. What is that? It's the real performance that a supercomputer demonstrates when it's solving standard linear algebra problems. The units, in this case, gigaflops, which means one billion floating point operations every second. So that's one billion multiplies, divides, adds, subtracts every second. That's the original unit. Now, as time has passed, we started in the gigascale era. Very quickly, we were up to the terascale area here in the late 1990s. Uh, then we hit the petascale. Here's the top computer, the first in the list, hitting petascales back here around 2010. And of course, the next scale is the exascale. And you can see that we should be looking at exascale in 2020. Now, it'd be lovely to be number one, but to be in the top 500 list, you need to pay attention to the 500th, and here it is in blue. If you want to be in the list, you've got to be above this curve. The other thing that we like to look at is the sum of all of the computers between the first and the 500th, and that's plotted here as the green line. Now, the rate of growth is particularly important. You're looking at, typically, 1.8 per year. That means that the speed of supercomputers is almost doubling every year. If you don't keep up with that, three years' time, your factor of eight behind, and that can be problematic. What about the academic and research sectors? Well, here's the academic sector here in blue. We've got the research sector in red. We've got the sum here in dark blue and then the sum of the top 500 in green again. So what can you take home from that? First of all, academic and research sectors, they do track that trend of the top 500 sum. And in fact, these sectors are the ones that dominate that top 500. So who's in the top 500? When I'm asked, I like to refer back to the June 2016 list. Of course, the reason being, I get to say the University of Adelaide was in it. But we have very good company. You'll find. University of Tokyo, Edinburgh, Purdue. Well, there's, there's lots of good company. In fact, there are 94 academics institutions in that top 500 list. You'll also find some real powerhouse research institutes, like Riken with number five in the list. Uh, Ulick with the Jew Queen at 14. Uh, Posi comes in at 79 with Magnus and Rigens there from the NCI at 99. And Victorian Life Sciences Computation Initiative is also there. Here's the Magnus supercomputer uh, at the POSI Center, 35,000 cores plus, delivering 1.5 petaflops, serving Australia. It was 58th fastest in the world when it appeared. Here's Rigen, 72nd when it appeared, 1.1 petaflops, serving Australia. And recently, it was just upgraded. And so on the June 2017 list, we see it's now 70th in the list and serving 1.7 petaflops for Australia. 
Here's how these Australian national resources sit into the top 500. Again, we've got the 500th here in blue. We've got the number one in the list in yellow. And the orange takes care of the Australian supercomputers. We started off with the SC quite some time ago, well within the top 500, a very nice machine. And as it was getting old and close to the 500th, along came the AC. And that, again, was a very nice machine. But you can see that it lived far too long. It fell out of the top 500. And in fact, in early uh, 2010, 2011, this was a very dark time for supercomputing in Australia. You were trying to serve the nation's need with a supercomputer that wasn't even in the top 500. Fortunately, that was addressed with the introduction of VEU, followed by Rigen, and now Magnus running alongside Rigen. And then there's also the recent upgrade here. It's a different story, though, for how much of this compute power was delivered to Lattice QCD. In the good old days, you can see that we would get about 10%, right? One decade down from the whole machine, about 10% for Lattice QCD. But when VEU came along, you can see that there was a jump of a factor of over 10, and yet a very small increase in Lattice QCD. We went from 10% of the machine to the order of 1% to 2%. The reason for this is that the funding model provides only a small proportion of these machines for the national merit-based allocation, and that is a problem. And I'm pleased to say that we're making some progress towards resolving this, but much more work needs to be done. So we look to South Australia. What can we get locally? How can we uh, make up for this gap that we're missing? So here's the South Australian resources in the context of the 500th and the top 500. Back in the good old days, back early 2000s, we had Orion. It was the national facility for lattice gauge theory. It meant that we had the whole machine to ourselves, and that was pretty great. Uh, shortly after that, Hydra came along. It was a teraflop computer, so we were excited about that. It was complemented by Aquila. So again, South Australia had supercomputers in the top 500. And then you can see we ran into the same problem, that these computers were left running for too long. They weren't upgraded. You fall out of the top 500. Corvus came along and just squeaked over the line, but then survived way too long. Eventually, Tizard got close to the top 500, but there wasn't enough investment to get us back to where we needed to be. Then we had problems with equipment failure. Phoenix came along to save the day to some extent, but we're a long way away from the top 500. And it was the University of Adelaide stepping forward, investing over $3.5 million into South Australian computing to get us the Phoenix upgrade, which put us back well in the top 500 again. And of course, we're very concerned. What's next? We need to keep investing. If we're not in the top 500, we're in trouble. How much of that has been allocated to Lattice QCD? That trend line is very much uh, below where it needs to be. I'm happy to say that we're on the high side of the curve, but it's a problem. And so when you put it all together, Lattice QCD resources in Australia, compared to the top 500, we're not where we need to be. We need to be here. But we're doing fairly well. We're within a factor of six, and it's a lot better than a factor of 30 that we're dealing with back in 2011. OK, so there's a tremendous need for speed. If you're falling behind by a factor of six, you've got some trouble. Whatever other people can do in a day, it takes you a week. What should be done in a month takes half a year. And, and look, you can, you can handle that. If you've got a good idea, if you're doing innovative work like the ARC asks us to, you can cope with that. But it's harder if you had a six-month calculation because that's going to take you three years, and that's probably too long. Fall behind by a factor of 10, which is not unusual. Three-day calculation now takes you a month. What others do in a month takes you a year. This is problematic. 
Six-month calculation is going to take you five years, so you won't even consider it. Factor of 30, what others do in a day, takes you a month. What should be done in two weeks now exceeds a year. Six-month calculation would be 15 years. You can't even play the game at this point. So need for speed. You really can't fall behind. If you're doing future planning, trying to select the next generation supercomputer, if you're not planning on being in the top 500, then you are planning to fail. How do we survive? We've got this factor of six. There are additional resources that have been very valuable to the group. One particular case was the IVEC Petascale Pioneers program. Back in 2014, they had large amounts of CPU hours that we needed to use in a short period of time. That's perfect. We can help you out with that any time. Just give us a call. We've also benefited from the Galaxy Supercomputing Time Grant. Another thing that the POSI Center has is the Slurm batch scheduling system. It's very, very clever at fitting smaller jobs into that machine so that they can run, be in bonus time. And the other thing is that they have soft limits on those allocations, so bonus time is good. Uh, the Athena Early Adopter Program is going on right now, and we're benefiting from that, not only from the extra resources, but actually being able to provide feedback on our codes, how they perform, and giving advice on what that next generation supercomputer should look like. I'm often approached by people saying, well, what about this system? You know, you could get these for this particular dollar per CPU hour. But it always takes me back to my supervisor back in 1989. His favorite saying was, if you have to pay for it, you cannot afford to do it. Neil Tyson has a nice quote here. He says, science is for anyone who's curious and wants to invest there. And we hope that Australians remain curious and encourage our governments to invest strongly in, in science in general. Not only do you need investment, but you need talent. And fortunately, uh, we have lots of talent here at the University of Adelaide. Uh, Professor Tony Thomas was a laureate fellow. Ross Young and James Zanotti were both future fellowships. Wasim plays a particularly important role in the group through algorithm development and the implementation of those algorithms on the latest architecture that might be available to us. We're also supported by postdoctoral research associates, recent PhD graduates, and a great number of PhD candidates and uh, MPhil candidate. Uh, we're all benefiting from very substantial resources through POSI and the NCI. I want to highlight two of the students, Josh and Finn. I'll be talking about their research as we go forward. All right, so let's get back to the physics. I want to tell you about the structure of gluons. Remember, empty space isn't empty. It's full of these quark and gluon field fluctuations. Let's have a look at it. I'm going to consider the energy density of the gluon field at each point in space and time. And that's just the square of the electric field strength and the magnetic field strength. And we add it up over those eight different gluon fields that are available. At each point in space-time, yes, there are eight electric fields, eight magnetic fields. We add up the energy associated with those fields. And in order to view the structure, what I'm going to do is render regions where that energy density is high in red, uh, regions where the energy density is dropping down, we'll render in blue. And the lowest energy density regions, I'm not going to render them at all, and that way we can see in to the volume of space and have a look at what these things look like. So let me bring up the animation. We're looking at a region of space. It's big enough to hold maybe two protons, so it's a fairly small region. And you can see there's a red hot seething mess of gluons. What I need to do is smooth it out. I'm going to get rid of the short distance fluctuations so I can show you the longer distance interesting aspects of what's going on here. So I'll do a few steps forward in the animation. Each time I'm trying to remove short distance fluctuations. And you can see then that we're now finally able to see some interesting structure in this gluon field. Let me run the animation for you now. So you can see that there are some areas where it was very easy to remove the energy density and other areas where it persists. And we understand the structure of the gluon fields and why those lumps persist, but this is absolutely critical to the origin of mass. 
So just a reminder that we're looking at an illustration of the energy density of a typical gluon field. When we do the lattice calculations, we average over hundreds to thousands of these configurations. What I want to do now is show you the time evolution of these lumps. Uh, we work on a periodic lattice, so as the movie runs, it will repeat, but you'll get an idea for the dynamics of empty space. So let's have a look at that. So as I step forward in time, you'll see some time evolution of these lumps, and perhaps the best way to see it is simply to run the animation. I'll spin it around so you can get a feel for the structure that's within this. First time we looked at this, I had a student that came down and said, you know, I hope you're not offended by this, but it looks a lot like a lava lamp. And I thought, yes, you're right, but it's even better than a lava lamp. Because although the lumps move around in a lava lamp, just like they do here, here it's better because they exist for a brief instant in time, and then they disappear, like this one here. There, gone. And here now, gone. So that's better than a lava lamp. But we were pleased to have that, uh, that phrase stick. This work was made quite popular when Professor Frank Wilczek uh, included this in his Nobel Prize acceptance lecture back in 2004. If you want to learn more about uh, the vacuum and that empty space isn't empty, you can also find the Veritasium channel on YouTube where you can see a video on empty space is not empty. Why is this so important? It's because those lumps that you're seeing in the QCD vacuum, they interact with the quarks and they generate mass. That's the origin of mass in the proton. That's what's going on. Here's a plot where on the x-axis, I'm using a measure of momentum transfer that governs the resolution at which you look. If you've seen a Fourier transform, you'll know that large momenta correspond to uh, short distances. So we've got short distance here We've got large distances here, and you can see on the y-axis, we're looking at the apparent mass of a quark as it sits in the proton. Now out here, large momenta, short distances, not much is happening. You see the mass that was put into the simulation here, the dot dash curve, and a little bit of mass generation, but really nothing to get excited about. This area is called asymptotic freedom. It's a very important aspect of QCD. The interactions become weak at short distances. But at large distances, this is where you have dynamical mass generation. And so if you're looking at matter at the scale of a proton, that's a large scale in this game. And you see dynamical mass generation. And that, then, is the origin of mass in the universe. Here's an artistic rendition of the proton. So you can see the energy density of the gluons. We know that the quarks like to spend most of their time on top of those lumps. That's where you'll find them, most probably. And it's these interactions then that generate the mass of the quarks. But proton structure is more complicated than just three quarks. You can also have quark-antiquark -quark pairs. In this illustration, we have a strange quark and an anti-strange quark here. And that's part of the proton structure. And if you can see it, there's some gluon flux tubes here that bind these three quarks into a baryon like the proton. This one's actually the lambda. And you've got a U S bar, which is a K plus meson. These are sort of like molecular ideas. And that's part of the proton structure as well. So it's, it's complicated. But yes, the three quarks composing the proton, complemented by other quark-anti-quark -quark pairs, not just strange-anti-strange, down-anti-down, up, anti-up is fine too. And you will find them sitting on top of the lumps. It's those lumps in the gluon field that give rise to mass. What's this? This is how experimentalists investigate the structure of the proton. The straight line here is an electron. It doesn't couple directly to the gluon field, so it just plows straight through. Same with the photon. Photon comes in here, hits a strange quark, so experimentalists can learn about how the strange quarks contribute to proton structure. And of course, they measure this outgoing electron and learn about structure through that measurement. 
If you want to learn more about flux tubes and meson baryon molecular states, again, you can go to the Veritasium channel, look for a video called Your Mass is Not from the Higgs boson. And it really isn't. I like showing this animation because it gives me an opportunity to show you how supercomputers are used in calculating quantum chromodynamic properties. You're looking at a very small region of space. Again, it's about the size of a proton. The lumps you're looking at are regions in space where you could have a quark-antiquark -quark pair or maybe three quarks that would form a baryon. Within a single colored region, the energy associated with those quark-antiquark -quark pairs or three quarks is finite. So you're actually looking at regions of space that QCD is creating where you can have things like the very core of a proton or the very core of a meson existing. You're looking at structures generated by QCD that govern the size of a proton. What's the animation? We're stepping forward through simulation time. We're proposing new link variables and asking QCD, is this a good choice? Is this a probable configuration? And if QCD says yes, then we keep it, and we keep moving forward in simulation time. Now, in the upper left corner, you can see that there's a temperature indicated there. And we're actually at the critical temperature of QCD. That's an interesting temperature. It's the temperature at which quarks are supposed to become free. You lose the confinement of quarks to within protons, and they're supposed to be able to travel very large distances with finite energy. So what we would expect to see then in this animation is that there would be a, one of the colors would win out over the other colors, that it would define then a very big region where quarks can propagate with finite energy. And you can see here that the red color is in fact winning. And now you have the deconfinement of quarks because quarks now can spread out to very, very large distances with finite energy. How big are the jobs that we run on Magnus? That's an interesting question. Well, we're running modern Fortran code uh, using the MPI, the message passing interface. We typically work with somewhere between 16 and 32 nodes. There's 24 co cores per node, so we're looking at 384 to 768 cores running in parallel. And that's pretty small, actually, uh, these days. I mean, we could run a lot larger, but we don't need to. And by keeping it somewhat small, we can fit into the nooks and crannies of the machine and get extra time, which is so important. Our wall time is typically two to four hours, which is a nice, comfortable point at which we can checkpoint. Let me take you now to the cutting edge of what we're doing here at the University of Adelaide. And I want to talk about this animation that's running. This is a really interesting calculation because it's not only quantum chromodynamics that's been put on the lattice, but quantum electrodynamics is also there. Simultaneously, quark and color degrees of freedom are working with quantum electrodynamic degrees of freedom. Because remember, quarks carry charge. The up quark has charge 2 thirds. The down quark has charge minus a third. So these charges can interact with the photon field. And that's part of this image. What are we looking at here? So the yellow and red blobs are regions of topological charge density that's large. It's kind of like the energy density, only instead of measuring E squared plus B squared, we're actually measuring the alignment of the electric and magnetic fields. And they can be aligned, or they can be anti-aligned. In that case, that's the blue and green blobs, where the color fields tend to be more anti-aligned than aligned. What about the red blobs? That's electric charge. That's the quarks in the vacuum generating pockets of positive charge. And the purple is the negative electric charge. And so charges and topological charge are moving around. And as those uh, charges move around, they generate interesting magnetic fields. And we're very keen to have a look and understand that. So this is work that James Zanotti and Ross Young at the University of Adelaide have been leading with uh, international collaborators. And the entire group is, in fact, working together now to analyze these uh, configurations and 
find out what the physics is that's going on inside these supercomputers. We want to see it and understand it. So I now want to talk to you about the magnetic field. There's a magnetic field that's generated by the motion of those quarks, uh, the electric charges that we were looking at in the previous animation. We want to understand how that magnetic field interacts with the quantum chromodynamic parts of what's going on in the vacuum. We talked about these yellow areas of being positive topological charge density, and these greeny blue areas, negative topological charge density, associated with the alignment or anti-alignment of the color fields. They're interesting because they give rise to interesting combinations of the momentum of the quarks as they move in the vacuum and the direction of their magnetic moments or their angular momentum. And in fact, it means then that there will be interesting interactions of the quarks which are combined to have particular properties inside of the QCD areas. How do they interact with the magnetic field? Those are the kinds of things we're interested in. There's a wonderful effect called the chiral magnetic effect that we're looking for. But here's what the animation looks like, and it's quite fascinating to watch. So here again, you've got QCD, topological charge density, like the energy density we were looking at in QCD earlier. You've got the electric charge in red and negative electric charge in purple. And as they move around, they generate this magnetic field. That's the vector field that we're plotting here. And it's the interaction of that magnetic field with the QCD degrees of freedom that gives rise to things like the chiral magnetic effect. That's what we're looking for, and we're very pleased to have just found it. Let me summarize. It's an absolutely amazing time to be involved in lattice QCD research. Supercomputer development has been absolutely key. There's no way that we could do the things that we're doing today without the world's fastest supercomputers. At the same time, algorithmic development has been equally important. The breakthroughs have been amazing. And now we're actually to the point where the emergent phenomena of QCD is really being revealed. We're really learning how this fundamental quantum field theory governs the universe in which we live. It's also making it possible for us to understand QCD well enough that we can begin to search for physics beyond what we know. You can't start looking for new physics until you can accurately calculate the physics that you think you know. And we're there now. The role of the POSI Center is really central to the success that we've enjoyed here in Australia, in Lattice QCD, and it's a pleasure to thank our colleagues at the POSI Center for their support.